Hello and welcome to Stars, Cells, and God, the show where we discuss new discoveries taking place at the frontiers of science that have theological and philosophical implications, as well as new discoveries that point to the reality of God's existence and his character attributes. My name is Hugh Ross. I'm the founder of Reasons to Believe, an astronomer and a pastor, and today I'm joined by Fazrana, the president and CEO of Reasons to Believe and a biochemist and a biophysicist. Before we get into the discussion, I wanted to encourage you to subscribe to our channel, Reasons to Believe YouTube channel, so that you can be notified of our new weekly videos. Learn more at reasons.org or by following us on social media at RTV underscore official. Now, Fuzz, uh, you got a really interesting discovery on uh, behavior, animal behavior. Yeah, I can't wait to hear about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and to kind of ease us into the into the the discovery, I don't know if you are like me, but I'm not very comfortable in social gatherings, particularly if I don't know many of the people there. I don't know if that's your uh, your sense or your feeling. I seem to be okay when I'm surrounded by strangers I don't know. Uh, mainly because I don't really care how they <laughs> respond to me. So. Okay, well. They just being on the autistic spectrum that makes it easier for me. I actually find it more challenging to socially engage people uh, that I know there's only one or two people around. Oh, uh, interesting. Yeah, because if it's a big crowd, uh, my autistic handicaps aren't going to be that noticeable. So, okay, well, interesting. But, <laughs> yeah, no, well, because I'm, I'm a bit of a, an introvert, and so... I would have never guessed, Buzz. I, well, I've seen uh, you at staff meetings. There's no way. Well, <laughs> it, it you know my Myers Briggs is kind of too humped. If I'm around people I know, I've, I'm I'm extroverted. But if I'm around people I don't know or don't know well, I just really you know I'm very much introverted. Well, I took the Myers Briggs and I came out as an N E R D. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> I never would have guessed you. <laughs> Wouldn't it? <laughs> but but anyway, you know, one of the things that that people do at these icebreakers, or, or sorry, at these social gatherings, is they have these icebreakers, right. and I I hate icebreakers. I don't like them either. <laughs> yeah, but but one of them that's that's fairly common is the either or game, and so just for kicks, I. Just just thought we could quickly play uh, an either or game. You're going to put me on the spot, right? <laughs> well, hopefully not too much. And, and I'll answer too. But the, the idea here is, is that this is actually making a, a point that is relevant to, to what I want to talk about. Okay. But uh, one of them is, uh, do you prefer an Android phone or an iPhone? Oh, wow. I don't really care. To tell okay. You the truth. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I very much prefer iPhones, so I'm in that camp. Um, here's one: when you are out having dinner with your lovely wife, mm -hmm. uh, do you like to share food or do you don't like to share food? Well, my wife likes to share food with me because she knows I need to eat about <laughs> twice as much as she does. So it's a one-way uh, situation. Yeah, well, I'm not very much into sharing food. So, you know, if it, well, if you offer it to me, I'll eat it. <laughs> yeah, well, but, you know, sometimes my, my wife likes to order. She can't decide what she wants. So she wants me to order and her, uh, something and she'll order something. Oh, and then, I've seen your wife in action. That's <laughs> definitely the way she is. I remember her on a cruise, she ordered eight different desserts. Yep, yep. And had us all sample them. <laughs> yep, yep. Well, I, uh, I, uh, I, when I order, I know what I want and how much I want. And so I'm not really that interested in sharing. But anyway, a couple more. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you prefer dark chocolate or milk chocolate? I think oh, I know. Dark chocolate. Yeah, I knew the answer to that one. <laughs> I probably lean towards towards milk chocolate. And then uh, one one other one. Um, do you prefer bar soap or body wash? And that may be TMI here, but <laughs> definitely bar soap is so much faster to shower. Oh yeah, <laughs> same here. Body wash. I hate I hate body wash. Yeah. So so anyway, the, the the point of this is that you know this is a kind of a fun either or game right. that's really kind of nonsensical. But there is a very important either or question that has broad ranging implications, particularly for how we think about ourselves as human beings, how we think about others, and even how we think about our place in the cosmos. And that is, are we different in degree or kind from other creatures? 
right? And, and the biblical view is that human beings are different in kind, right. that we're made in God's image uniquely, and that this idea of being image bearers means that we can enter into a relationship with our creator in a way that no other creature uh, can. And, and, and this, of course, today is mediated through the person of Christ. But it, it's the foundation of the gospel that we are image bearers and that we are fundamentally different in kind than other creatures. It's also the foundation of Christian ethics as well. Uh, but this idea that, you know, human beings are different in kind is an idea that has uh, fallen out of favor among anthropologists. Yeah, very much challenged. Right, and, and this goes all the way back to to Darwin in his book, um, The Descent of Man, 1871 or something like right. that. It was when the book was published. And in the book, there's a number of very well-known statements. This is one that, that really has shaped uh, evolutionary anthropology and the study of human origins for 170 years, and that's this. You know, the difference in mind between man and higher animals, great as it is, certainly is one of degree, not kind. You know, with the idea that these creatures that precede us in in the fossil record uh, have the antecedents to the, the behaviors that we think make us unique or special as human beings, and that these behaviors successfully, successively over time become more and more pronounced. Now, interestingly enough, in recent years, this idea of humans differing only in degree, not kind from other creatures, has actually been challenged, uh, believe it or not, by evolutionary anthropologists who wouldn't necessarily be friends to our position, you know, as, as old earth creationists. Uh, but they argue that when you really look at the scientific data, we do seem to be... Uh, completely different than other creatures that we we stand apart. And this is a growing viewpoint, actually, among anthropologists. I do, as you do, a lot of uh, interactions with people through different YouTube channels. Many of them, these interactions involve people who are non-believers, uh, who uh, are strong advocates of an evolutionary view of life. And Almost to a person, they readily agree that human beings indeed are exceptional. Well, I remember one research paper I had the title Darwin's Mistake. Right. And the mistake was this statement. Yeah. So it's like it yeah. is now being acknowledged. And there's a, a great book. It's a few years old now. But if people are interested in, in, in digging into this a little bit, it's a book called The Gap written by Thomas Sudendorf. Yeah, I love this subtitle. Yeah. The science of what separates us from from other animals, and and this is what Sudendorf writes, and I've and I've quoted this a few times, but I love this statement. You know, we reflect on and argue about our present situation, our history, and our destiny. We envision wonderful, harmonious worlds as easily as we do dreadful tyrannies. Our powers are used for good as they are for bad, and we incessantly debate which is which. Our minds have spawned civilizations and technologies that have changed the face of the earth, while our closest living animal relatives sit unobtrusively in their remaining force, there appears to be a tremendous gap between human and animal minds. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the argument here is that, you know, what makes us different is our capacity for symbolism. This is Sudendorf's view and many others as well. It's our capacity to represent the world with symbols and then to combine and recombine them in you know, a near infinite number of ways. And that allows us to do things like anticipate the future, re reflect upon the, the past. It gives us the ability for mental time travel, you know, uh, advanced, you know, um, uh, interactions of those symbols, you know, through logic and, and through mathematical relationships. So this is a very, very powerful capability that according to Sudendorf really does indeed set us apart. Um, something else, too, that's part of this is our theory of mind in that we recognize that others have minds like ours and we can anticipate what they're thinking. We, we can anticipate what we're, they're feeling and that we have this willingness then to try to connect our minds uh, together, which makes humans a very powerful force. Now, 
Uh, there are people still today, though, who actively challenge the idea of human exceptionalism. So this is a, an area of active d debate among anthropologists. And part of the argument against um, human exceptionalism is some of the remarkable work that's taking place in animal behavior, where people are now really beginning to recognize that animals are doing some pretty sophisticated things that nobody really had the full appreciation of. Animals, you know, are capable of planning, uh, seemingly to anticipating the future. They're able to problem solve. Uh, animals seem to have an emotionally rich life where they definitely mourn and grieve when right. they lose a companion. Uh, some people think that animals may even have a capacity for love. Uh, or they, they seem to have some kind of uh, sense of fair play, uh, a, 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 maybe a rudimentary sense of justice. Right. Some even argue there might even be a rudimentary sense of morality among animals. Now, these are clearly controversial claims, but these are this is part of the evidence against human exceptionalism and the idea that we only differ in degree, not kind. And a, a book that I've been working through is by Nathan Lentz. Actually, it's a signed copy. I just realized today. He, Nathan actually came to the RTB office yes. and took part in a human origins workshop that we did. Mm -hmm. But the title of the book is Not So Different, uh, Finding Human Nature in Animals. And so his argument is that we really aren't exceptional uh, because of the sophisticated things that animals are doing. And so this is where the, the new discovery that I want to talk about comes into play. And this is uh, uh, a, based on a series of studies that have been done uh, by a Swedish researcher by the name of Johan Lind. And in 2018, he published this article uh, in the Royal Society Open Science Journal, uh, where he made the argument that uh, when we think about uh, the sophisticated behavior of animals, we are neglecting perhaps a, an explanation for this behavior in that it is due to associative learning. And he, he makes the argument that when you look at AI systems, they are able to do some very sophisticated things and actually are even able to learn, but they're doing it through associative learning. So, kind of like Google Translate. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, we may not realize it, but AI systems are built on, again, associative learning where right. you have a training set and that training set is certain stimuli and certain outputs where, you know, the output is scored, you know, based on you know, the desirability, the higher the score, the more desirable that particular output. And so you you train, you know, these machine learning systems with that training set. Uh, and then as they take that training set and begin to interact with, you know, data that's not part of the training set, they then are recording, you know, scores for the, their response to that to that. Uh, I've got to see input. That personally, with Google Translate, where I was working on social media uh, with a physicist in Ukraine, and uh, he didn't know English, I didn't know Ukrainian. We used Google Translate, and I noticed the software was designed to respond to our complaints. Uh -huh. uh, the software figured out where we were having problems communicating to one another and made adjustments. Yeah. And it didn't take very long for Google Translate to become almost fluent and translating Ukrainian into English and English into yeah. Ukrainian. Yeah. So, yeah. very impressive. But it's all through associative learning, yeah. right? Which, you know, and for people that aren't familiar with that, it's the, the old experiment of Pavlov where there's a stimulus and then there's a reward, you know, and, and so the animal connects that the, the stimulus to the reward. So that's what associative learning is. And so he, he uh, developed this uh, computer simulation where he showed that some of these, some very well-known examples of, uh, of, of what appears to be planning and problem solving in corvids, as well as in, in the great apes, could essentially be explained through associative learning. You, you didn't need flexible planning 
it, you know, these animals didn't need to have the capacities that we have as humans for flexible planning in order to solve problems, even some very difficult problems, or to begin to, to engage in planning behavior, that this could all be explained through associative learning. In fact... Providing the reward is adequate. Right, yeah. right. I mean, we, we humans can do without a reward. Right. These animals need a reward. Right, that's, yeah. that, that's right, and that's, that's very much part of it. The stronger the the reward, the, the more likely to connect that stimulus to, right. to the reward. Uh, but So I wrote a blog about this a few years ago, just simply making the point that, um, that even though we see you know, animals engaged in some pretty sophisticated behavior, it, it is very well a mistake to somehow attribute that sophisticated behavior to uh, the fact that they may be much more like us than we think, that there's another way to explain that be sophisticated behavior through associative learning that still retains the idea of human exceptionalism that we're different in kind. And so as a, a follow-up, um, there was a paper published at the very end of 2021 uh, in, uh, in, in this uh, BioRXIV website. So it's a preprint. It's a preprint. Right. Uh, I haven't seen any evidence that it's been published at, at this up to this point, uh, but uh, Johan Lind has developed a a computer model called A Learning, which is designed to explore the capabilities of associative learning, and uh, and he used that mo in this particular paper. He uses that that model or that computer simulation to to care to look at probably about 15 or 20 different uh, animal studies where animals are involved in different kinds of learning tasks. You know, and, and just for kicks, I, I could read off what a few of these are. Like there's, for example, a tea maze where it's a, a tea and then there's food at one, in one end of the maze, or the tea, there's not food at the other and the animal learns where to go in the maze. That's a fairly simple test. But things like delayed gratification, where you give like a, an ape, you know, a bowl of fruit and you're adding fr pieces of fruit one at a time. And if the ape learns to wait to pull the bowl towards him, he, he or she will get more food. Right. But, so it's, it's learning delayed gratification. Uh, there's also uh, the detour task, you know, where they have to, to move around obstacles to get to the reward, uh, the cylindrical task where they, they, uh, the reward or the, the reward is, or the piece of food is in a, a transparent cylinder and they have to learn to go into the cylinder, uh, to get the food, to get the food. There's the, um, let's see here. Uh, there's the Thorndike's puzzle box, um, spatial, uh, elimination, uh, let's see, uh, support and gravity bias, uh, a radial maze, uh, object uh, permanence, numerosity, tool usage. So there's an, a number of these classic uh, experimental protocols that people subject animals to, to assess their intelligence, to assess their learning. And his point is that all of this behavior can easily be explained by associative learning. And this is what he he concludes here is that uh, associative learning is an, is an underestimated general mechanism that can account for a large array of behavioral phenomena observed in animals. And so I think, again, this is really significant because it brings together what appear to be two disparate observations, animal intelligence and some remarkable behavior in animals and this idea of human exceptionalism. If we then argue that what humans are doing that makes us different in kind is unique to humans, and that animals, again, are engaged in some sophisticated behavior, but we shouldn't conflate that behavior with the antecedents to what we're doing as humans. And something that also factors into this is our, is our tendency to anthropomorphize. Right. This is actually... Right. Yeah, well, and this is actually part of what makes us what people like Sudendorf thinks that makes us uh, unique as human beings is that, again, this is due, due to theory of mind. I, get, I can anticipate what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and so I can connect with you in a way uh, that that 
you know, allows us to cooperate. But what happens is I don't know how to turn that off. So then when I'm interacting with my cats, I easily attribute human behavior, hum, or to their behavior, I attribute human motives, you know, human thoughts, you know, and, and things like that. I, I make them appear to be more human than they are, than they actually are. And in fact, uh, Marion Stamp uh, Dawkins, who was Richard Dawkins' first wife, she is in, in her own right a scholar and is a studies animal behavior. She's written a book where she raises the the question or raises the concern that many of the interpretations of these animal behavioral studies are riddled with anthropomorphism, and the researchers don't fully appreciate the the effect of that. Right. Yeah. So so anyway. Uh, this is a, a qu another quote from Sudendorf, where he, and this is a little confusing, so I'll unpack it, where he says that our ability basically for symbolism, open-ended generative capacity, and um, our theory of mind uh, turn animal communications into open-ended human language. And what he means there is animals are able to communicate, but what we're doing when we communicate with language is qualitatively different. That capacity uh, sets, you know, our language abilities apart fun and it's fundamentally, a fundamentally different capacity than what animals do when they communicate. Uh, memory into time travel, um, social cognition into theory of mind, problem solving into abstract reasoning, social traditions into cumulative culture, and empathy into morality. And so he's pointing out again that we, we really, really are uh, unique. Now, well, we tell stories. You don't really see animals telling uh, legends or ethics. Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that, Hugh. You, you set me up beautifully okay, here. <laughs> but this is a just a very short a paragraph in Nathan Lent's book where he he's, you know, finished laying out his thesis that animals really aren't that different from us. And then he says, I think both humans and chimps feel love. The only difference is, is that humans write sonnets about it. <laughs> I think both humans and dolphins practice fair play, but only humans enact laws to govern it. I think both humans and elephants experience grief, but only humans seek professional counseling to cope with it. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, indeed, we, we do, you know, have a shared sense of fair play with other animals. We do grieve like other animals grieve. You know, we, maybe we even experience love in ways that other animals experience love. But what sets us apart is that we're able to write sonnets. We're able to enact laws. We we sit down with people to process our grief. This is all possible. Songs about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We yeah, country and western <laughs> songs, right? You know. So so the but the point is is that all of those activities are only possible because we possess symbolic capabilities and open-ended generative capacity, right. which the animals don't. And so interestingly enough, in that one paragraph, I believe Nathan Lentz has actually undermined his whole case. His whole case. Right, exactly. So so anyway, this, you know, this is a, again a, a very important either or, you know, question, you know, are we different in degree or kind that has again broad ranging implications. Uh, and I think the evidence you know, consistently indicates we are different in kind, that we are exceptional. And this gives credibility to the biblical view of human identity and human nature. Well, I think the biblical worldview also gives an explanation for why we anthropomorphize. Mm -hmm. I mean, you began this whole discussion by pointing out we're created in the image of God. And uh, we're image bearers. And as image bearers, God gave us a mandate uh, to care mm. for all life on planet Earth, manage the resources of our planet for our benefit and the benefit of all life. And he actually created, as it tells us in Genesis 1, a separate category of animals that he designed to relate to us, to serve and please us, the nephesh creatures. He designed them to help us launch civilization. And these are creatures that have a desire to relate to us. They want to serve us. They want to entertain us. And so it's natural that God's going to build within them these capabilities to foster that relationship 
with us human beings, which I, in my opinion, mm. explains the fact why these researchers think they get mm. human-like qualities. They have to possess these qualities if they're going to be able to relate to us mm -hmm. and to serve and please us. Yeah. But there's a limit. Right. I mean, we, we see the characteristics that are necessary for them to be able to fulfill their roles in serving and pleasing us. And I like the fact they're lower animals. God gave them these attributes to be able to serve and please a higher being, namely mm. us. He did the same thing for us. Mm. He gave us the capability to serve and please a higher being, to relate to him, and that's God himself. Mm. And so there's a difference. I don't see animals relating to God. We alone right. uh, relate to God. We alone have that capacity. But I love what Job says, look to these creatures, yeah. referring to the birds and the mammals. They'll teach you. Yeah. They'll instruct you. Uh, not just about physical things, but spiritual things. Yeah. So this is great, Fuzz. Uh, I love what you've done here, because uh, anthropomorphization is all over the place in the yeah. scientific literature yeah. on these studies of animals. And I think we need to actually be able to explain to people why we mm. have that tendency. Right. I mean, I don't know anybody who has had a pet that they really like that doesn't anthropomorphize the behavior in that pet. Yeah. And I think it's more uh, evident in pets uh, or any animal we have a strong emotional bond with. Because another principle is see in the book of Job, when they're bonded to us, they outperform their wild uh, mm. cousins. And there's been a number of research papers pointing this out. There's a difference between a wild Caledonian crow and a tame Caledonian crow. The tame crow will outperform the wild crow. That's because of the relationship mm -hmm. it has with us. But we tend to look at these tamed animals and think they're just like us. Well, no, compare them with their wild cousins. You'll see a difference. And the difference is the relationship they have with us. Yeah. Powerful stuff. Right. Okay. Well, Hugh, I think you're up. So well, uh, I'm basically talking about a similar subject. I'm also going to begin with the fact that uh, we were created in the image of God. Mm -hmm. And as created in the image of God, God has given us a mandate to care for the planet, to care for all of its life, mm -hmm. to manage the planet's resources for our benefit and the benefit of all life. And I think part of that is to recognize God created plants and animals in such a way to help us fulfill that mandate. And so, as it says in Psalm 104, uh, look to the creatures. You know, it displays God's wisdom, his power, but it also displays how wonderfully he designed them mm -hmm. to help us fulfill our role as image bearers on this planet. And uh, I'm referring to a paper that got published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I'm really, I remember when you joined the staff, you said, Hugh, I know we don't have a lot of money, but we have to subscribe to the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And you remember those days, we were really strapped for cash. Yeah. But uh, we made the sacrifice and subscribed to that journal. And it really has been great because I notice they tend to specialize in articles that are interdisciplinary. Yeah. And that's kind of what we're doing at Reasons to Believe, mm -hmm. is taking revelation across all the scientific disciplines and using that to build new reasons uh, to believe. So thank you for saying, hey, you. <laughs> Cut my salary if you have to. We didn't do that. But uh, we, we got a subscription. But uh, in one of the latest issues, they talk about uh, bison, what many people refer to as buffalo. And basically they're making the point, you know, we nearly wiped out the buffalo mm. here in North America. Before Europeans came here, there were 50 to 60 million buffalo bison wandering around North America. And I had no idea until I read this paper uh, how extensive their habitat was. They literally were uh, roaming over half of the total territory of North America. Oh, wow. All the way down to Mexico, all the way up to Canada's Northwest Territories, uh, all the way to Virginia and Pennsylvania, and all the way to Eastern Oregon and Nevada. I mean, you know, North America was their home. Wow. And uh, 60 million of these creatures. And... Uh, you know, I've had several close encounters with uh, these uh, bison. They're enormous creatures. When you see them up close, it, it's just pretty stunning. Because, uh, you know, the buffalo will stand taller than a human being. 
uh, typically around six, eight, six, seven. Uh, they're more than 11 feet long. Wow. So, I mean, they're, they're huge creatures. Uh, they weigh 1,300 kilograms, almost 3,000 pounds. And one thing I've learned in these close encounters, you don't say no to a bison. Uh, but once you're picnic table, you just move away. It's going to come right in there. It's not going to pay attention to you. And uh, be careful uh, when you're, say, driving through Yellowstone. doesn't matter how big your pickup truck is. They can easily flip your truck over. Mm. And so if you see them coming, get out of their way because uh, they're not going to move for anybody. Uh, they're used to being the king. Uh, I mean, they're called a megafauna. Mm -hmm. And today, uh, bison rank is the largest remaining animal in North America, mm. terrestrial animal. And uh, I personally enjoy being around them because they're, they're magnificent creatures. Mm -hmm. uh, but the paper begins by saying uh, that we've missed the boat on bison. And by the way, we nearly wiped them out. I think it was around 1885, mm -hmm. we were down to only 400 individual bison on the entire North American continent. Fortunately, people stepped in and said, we dare not wipe these creatures out. And so there's been an effort to restore them. And today there's now a half million bison mm -hmm. in North America. We're still a long ways from the 50 to 60 million. And uh, the authors of this paper, they're all ecologists, are saying, we need to do a better job at uh, getting the population up to what it was uh, in the pre-European era. And they begin their paper saying, if you watch the behavior of bison, uh, when they're foraging in the grassland prairies, they're selectively uh, eating uh, the most nutritious grasses, uh, the ones that have the most calories, the most nutrition, uh, but these tend to be the dominant grass species in the prairie. And by, uh, you know, thinning them down, it gives room for other species. Mm -hmm. And so they were saying, maybe bison play a bigger role than we realize mm -hmm. in sustaining biodiversity. And because they're such big creatures, to get enough food, they have to travel literally tens of kilometers per day. And over the course of their lifetime, thousands of kilometers, which means they're moving nutrients throughout the environment. Mm. You know, they're eating grass, and they tend to defecate and urinate in places where there's not a lot of grass because they don't want to spoil the stuff that they're eating. But that distributes nutrients mm -hmm. and makes it possible uh, for the grassland ecosystem to expand. And uh, one that they didn't mention in the paper, but one that I've personally seen, is the behavior of wallowing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can pop up the, this slide. Uh, this is one I took in uh, uh, the uh, Grand Canyon National Park where they have a few hundred buffalo running around. And I was amazed how frequently the buffalo will stop eating and they'll fall down and they do this wallowing behavior and they do it for many minutes on mm -hmm. end. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen our dog and cat do it, but it's just a few seconds and they're up. You know, these buffalo will do it for several minutes. And of course, they're big creatures, weighing nearly 3,000 pounds. And so they go over on their back and they do this. And of course, they pick a shallow area to do mm -hmm. it uh, so they can get more of their body mm -hmm. in contact with the ground. But the end result is when they get up, there's a depression, a crater in the ground. And I've read a couple of papers making the point that craters created by buffalo wallowing are places that absorb extra moisture. And it creates, uh, you know, some, because you've ever been in Kansas, it's flat, mm -hmm. Saskatchewan, flat, uh, eastern uh, Montana, really flat. Buffalo wallowing basically breaks up that flatness. Mm -hmm. So it creates uh, diversity in the habitat space, which allows more animals to exist, as well as more mm -hmm. plants. So interestingly, bison enhance not only plant diversity, they also enhance animal diversity. Mm -hmm. Well, these researchers said, we need to actually measure this, not just quantitative or qualitatively, but quantitatively. Because previous studies have said, yes, buffalo enhance biodiversity. They said, we want to know by how much. And so they conducted a 27 year long experiment. Wow. Not just a couple of years, nearly three decades long. And so this is the published result after these 
uh, 27 years. And they said, uh, and what they did is they took parts of the Flintland uh, prairie, mm -hmm. tall grass prairie, and the uh, next slide shows you the map of where they did the research, basically eastern Kansas. Okay. And this is now a, a preserved area. It's called uh, the Flint Hills Eco Region, mm -hmm. and so they've taken steps to protect it. And so what these researchers did is they went into this region and they fenced off uh, plots of land. But uh, they said, we're not going to do what previous studies did where it was just a few hectares. They said, uh, we're going to make the uh, fenced-in plot areas large. Mm -hmm. And so the smallest one was 18 hectares. Many of them are much bigger. And for people who are not familiar with that unit, uh, we're talking 45-plus acres. Okay. So it's big enough uh, so that these bison uh, can roam throughout those 50 acres and get the food that they need. Uh, and be able to survive there for 27 years. Mm. And so they had enclosures where they had bison grazing on the tall grass. They had other enclosures mm. where it was domesticated cattle grazing on the grass. And then they had other enclosures where there was no grazing taking place mm. by cows or bison. And uh, so after 27 years, they were, well, the, every year they were measuring the biodiversity. And what they noticed was that uh, both cattle and bison enhanced biodiversity, but the bison did it at a much higher level mm. uh, than the cattle. And so what they discovered after the 27 years is that the plant diversity that was enhanced by the bison was 103% greater mm. than what you get with ungrazed land. And uh, with the domesticated cattle, the highest they ever got was 50%. Mm. So the bison did a way better job mm -hmm. uh, than the, uh, the cattle did. And both did better than just leaving the ground fallow and not letting any grazing take place at all. Mm -hmm. And so they figured out, okay, well, uh, both the cattle and the bison are selectively taking out mm -hmm. the dominant grasses, allowing more, but the bison does it better. Mm -hmm. And with the bison, it wanders more, mm -hmm. so you get more distribution of nutrients and the wallowing. Because uh, domesticated cattle rarely wallow. Bison are doing it constantly. So that's kind of the reason why mm -hmm. I think this, mm -hmm. uh, this is going on to this degree. But I think what really stunned them, and this wasn't ever noticed in a previous study, during that 27 years, there was a very severe drought in this uh, Flint Hills region. By the way, can you show the next slide? Yeah. Because it actually shows you what the region looks like. That's the tall grass, mm -hmm. and you have these low rolling hills mm -hmm. everywhere. It's kind of ideal uh, habitat mm -hmm. uh, for uh, the, the bison. Um, but there was two years within that 27 years, uh, 2011 and 2012, where there was a really severe drought more severe than the drought that took place in what they call the Dust Bowl mm -hmm. in the 1930s. In fact, they looked at uh, weather records over the past 100 years. This is the most severe drought that region had ever experienced. And what they notice is in the uh, enclosures where they had bison grazing, uh, the biodiversity was sustained. Where he had cattle, it was degraded. Mm. Where it wasn't grazed, it was even more degraded. Uh, but what they notice is the parts that were being grazed upon by the bison, uh, both the animal and the plant diversity were sustained. Mm. There was a resilience built in. Now, they didn't really explain why that's the case, but they said there's no doubt mm -hmm. we saw this. And they closed their paper off by saying, you know, with what people are saying about climate change, these kinds of severe droughts are going to be more common. And he said, before Europeans came, uh, there were droughts a thousand years ago, for example, that were more severe than what they experienced in 2011 and 2012. And yet the ecosystem survived. And it's because of just how many mm -hmm. bison were around. <clears throat> so the bottom line is, and they're basically saying, we think this is a principle that applies worldwide, mm -hmm. uh, that humans have not done too well in their creation care. I mean, the animals that are easiest right. for us to hunt 
and used for food. And uh, you know, leather are the big mammals. But they said big mammals play a crucial role in sustaining the ecosystem. And uh, it's to our economic benefit and the benefit of all of their life to do everything we can to restore the megafauna. Uh, not just preserve them at a level of a few hundred individuals, yeah. but try to get them back to the level they were previously. I don't know whether you've ever heard of this, but there's actually some promise that we're going to be able to bring back the mastodon mm -hmm. in North America. People thought that was impossible a decade ago, but thanks to genetic advances, yeah. they really think they're going to be able to pull it off. So it is actually possible that we could fulfill our creation mandate by correcting the mistakes of the yeah. past and bringing these creatures back. And uh, their whole point is, what if we were to get back to many millions of bison? Mm -hmm. uh, number one, uh, you get a healthier food. Uh, you know, the meat you get from bison is healthier to eat than it is from domesticated cattle. And uh, it seems to be able to withstand these droughts. Mm -hmm. It's good for the rest of the ecosystem. And hey, with domesticated cattle, we're having them graze anyway. It's basically pasture land. You yeah. can do the same thing uh, with the bison. And so I kind of look at this as a, a way that we can actually fulfill our role as image bearers. Uh, actually, actually, do what we can right. uh, to manage the planet in the way that God said. And at the same time, I've noticed when I've been in Yellowstone, or by the way, there's buffalo on Catalina Island. You go to Catalina Island, there's a few hundred buffalo there, or bison. So... Uh, Buzz, <laughs> just take a trip to Catalina and you'll be able to see there we go. these bison. Uh, but, uh, and, you know, there are many places in Canada and uh, uh, the United States. So, But I've noticed the impact that tourists have. Literally, hundreds of cars will stop. People get their cameras out to photograph uh, these bison. Uh, there's something charismatic mm -hmm. about these really big creatures. So I think there's an aesthetic benefit yeah. Uh, to bringing these creatures back to the numbers, close to the numbers of what they had yeah. before we mess things up. Now, it's interesting because it, it seems to me that you're suggesting or the researchers are, are suggesting that instead of doing cattle ranching, we really ought to be doing ranching with bison, yes. right? So that you, in a sense, are, you know, not necessarily... Um, turning productive farmland into kind of a, a natural reserve, but rather you can actually still have a functioning cattle ranch or bison ranch and be able to supply, you know, the, the, the needs that humans would have for meat and for, for leather while at the same time improving the, the ecosystem. Is that I think you can even make more money uh, by having a bison ranch than a cattle ranch. <laughs> Uh, well, obviously, if you're in, say, Texas or Oklahoma, that's subject to drought. These are creatures that are going to be able to withstand drought. And we know that uh, bison can withstand temperature extremes to a greater degree than cattle can. So they can, I mean, after all, uh, they have these bison up in the Northwest Territories of Canada. Yeah. So they can handle extreme cold uh, to a greater degree than cattle. And uh, the meat is healthier. And you get more meat uh, per bison than you do with uh, cattle. So there's actually an economic incentive to doing mm -hmm. this. And I think that's also something that sustains our biblical creation model. God designed our planet, its resources, and its life uh, so that we really can manage the planet, mm -hmm. not only for the benefit of the ecosystem, but for our benefit as well. Yeah. There are win-win solutions. Right. I look at buffalo as a prime example, bison, yeah. pardon me, uh, as a win-win solution. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating stuff. So, I don't know how we can make pets of the creatures, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, everybody needs a water buffalo, I guess. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, this is, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, as you can tell, we have fun doing these star cells in God. And I pray you do too, and that uh, with us, you learn things that really help us to appreciate this amazing planet that God has given us, all of its life, 
and actually gives us more reasons to believe in Jesus Christ as Creator, Lord, and Savior. Join the discussion in the comments below. We encourage you to post those comments. And remember to like this video and to subscribe for more content. New episodes of Stars, Cells, and God release each Thursday and are available here on YouTube and your favorite podcast app. Be sure to share this uh, video with a friend. And remember, the more we learn about science, the more reasons we have to believe in Jesus Christ as Creator, Lord, and Savior, and the inspiration and the inerrancy of God's book, the Bible. Thank you for joining us.